Um, Cape fur seals, we know these are the enemy of the birds. There is um, a small colony of uh, uh, seals that breed on Fondling Island, which is just outside Soldana Bay here. Um, the, the colony, it, it historically wasn't, there weren't any seals breeding here. Started, the seals started breeding on Fondling Island in about 2006. Uh, population grew quite quickly up till about uh, 17, 18, 20,000 pups per year born on Fondling Island and seems to have reached some sort of ca carrying capacity from about 2010, 2011 onwards. Um, most of these seals, well the ones that are having the pups are obviously the females. Um, there has been quite a lot of work tracking how these seals move around the bay. We find that these seals tend to feed offshore, um, in the, in the uh, offshore waters outside of the bay. The ones, the seals we find inside Saldana Bay, predating on the gannets, uh, sitting on top of the uh, mariculture infrastructure, tend to be the young male seals. They're the menace, they're the ones that are causing trouble on the islands. Um, but they are a natural part of our, our, our system. Um, seal populations were absolutely decimated back in the 1920s, 1930s, when they were hunted for their for their pelts, for their uh, mooty, for dog food, um, and populations have been recovering. Here, specifically in Soldana Bay, populations are quite stable. They have been stable for the last 10 years. Many people always ask me or tell me that seal numbers are increasing. So why, why have seal numbers increased so much in Soldana Bay? Well, the evidence that I've got, the data from the counts that are done on those islands, suggest that Certainly, female seals breeding on the islands there, yes, they did increase quite dramatically over the period of sort of 2000 to 2010, but they've been more or less stable now. Can't say, I can't speak for the male seals that are now, many of them are hanging around the bay. I think they are probably spending more time in the bay because they can't get the food they need offshore. They also eat sardines and anchovy, and they can't get enough food offshore, so they're coming into the bay just like the pelicans to predate on seabirds and uh, anything they can scavenge from the mariculture operations because they're not getting enough food offshore. Next slide, please. Okay, I promised um, to talk a little bit about alien invasive species. Um, but <coughs> before I do that, I just need to talk a little bit about uh, species distribution patterns in the oceans. Uh, many people see the world's oceans as being kind of this great interconnected, con ubiquitous system, um, but it's not really. The, we find that the natural movement of marine species around our oceans is quite restricted, and it's restricted by two main things. One is what we call thermal barriers, because there's significant temperature differences across the world oceans. Around the tropics, water tends to be quite warm, sort of 26, 25, 26 degrees. And as we go down towards the poles, it gets cooler and cooler. And around southern Africa, temperatures are quite cold on our west coast, sort of 12, 15 degrees. And our east coast tend to be quite a bit warmer, 17, 18, 20, up to 25 degrees. And the other thing is that there's the ocean between, for example, South Africa and South America is very deep, several thousand meters deep, and that is quite a significant barrier for marine species to move. So what happens is when we look at species distribution patterns around the world oceans, we tend to find that, there are, that the populations of marine species that occur in different regions are quite different to one another. So what the species we get on our west coast are quite different to, for example, the ones we get on our east coast. And going further north where the water's warmer, quite different species crop up. And then we're going through into the, the, the northern hemisphere, Europe, we get another different suite of species. And because there's a thermal barrier, although the temperatures are similar in Europe to what they are down here, there's a prevent, the species are prevented from mixing, so we find that they are very discrete different species. And that's kind of how things have persisted in the marine environment for, for God knows how many million years. And uh, next slide, please. Until we came along and uh, we introduced shipping. 
And shipping is a very powerful uh, vector for moving species around the world, and it transcends those thermal barriers and the deep ocean barriers that prevent species from moving around the world. So we know that roughly 90% of the world's goods are moved by ships. And uh, the ships are very effective at moving alien species around the world for two reasons. One is because of the ballast water they carry around with them, and the other is because of species that stick to the hulls of the vessels and get carried around the world in that way. So they stick on, they climb onto the ship when it's in, the, in, in a port, say, in Europe, and the ship comes down here, and the, those, those organisms stick on the ship until they come here, and they jump off, and now they're once again in shallow water, and they can easily survive there. Ballast water, in the old days, uh, vessels, okay, so vessel, ships need, they, they're designed to operate optimally, with optimal efficiency when they're full of cargo, because then they are low down in the water, the propellers like low down in the water, and they are quite stable. When you unload the cargo, the ship tends to rise up in the water, propeller pops out, and the ship becomes very unstable. So ships tend to, a lot of the uh, ships that are moving around the world, they go, they're full on only one journey. So when they're going from one port to, uh, from one side of the world to the other, they're carrying cargo. Coming back, they've got no cargo. So what they do is they fill the holds up with seawater just to give them the stability they need before they go back on their return journey. And that seawater, the problem with that is you're picking up seawater in a foreign port, in, a, in an environment that is different, and with that seawater comes a whole lot of alien species. Those alien species are comfortably able to survive in the ballast tanks until they arrive in the next port and where they are pumped out into that port. And problem is, is that Soldana is what we call a destination port. It means it's a port where cargo tends to be uplifted. So what happens in destination ports is ballast water is pumped out and replaced by cargo. And with that ballast water, out goes a whole lot of alien species that were taken up in wherever else the, the vessel took on, on wh where the cargo was offloaded. So destination ports around the world tend to be major centers for, for alien invasive species. Next slide, please. And Soldana Bay is obviously a case in point here. Uh, we've Work that we've done with the uh, state of the bay and that has been done by other academics, researchers in this country, we've picked up uh, at least 95 alien species in South Africa that have been transferred from other ports of the world. Uh, at least 67% or 67 of these 95 species occur on the west coast and we're pretty sure that many of those originated in Soldana Bay as a destination port. Alien species tend to be quite problematic, as you've seen in the terrestrial environment, because we don't, or we're not always so good that we transport their predators, their natural diseases with them. So when we introduce them into a new environment, they've got no natural predators, they've got no natural diseases, so they're easily able to outcompete the natural species, and they tend to proliferate, and they tend to overgrow and outcompete those native species. And this is, is, is a serious problem. Um, the work that we've done to date in trying to detect alien species is mostly ad hoc. We've never had any focused work. We, we've been picking up various alien species. During the other research work we do, we do the monitoring of the benthic macrofauna in the bay. We do monitoring of inter rocky intertidal. We do our fish netting surveys. And through those programs, we're able to pick up the alien species. Just very recently, through the ADZ, program. We've done started doing some focused alien species monitoring, monitoring work in Soldana. But to the, in the last five, in the last three years, we've picked up five new alien species. So it's a problem. It's an ongoing problem. It's happening all the time. So five years ago, well, three years ago, there were only 62. Now there are 67 known alien species in Soldana Bay. Um, something that's very encouraging for me last year, Anglo-Americans through their subsidiary Kumba Iron Ore agreed to fund a focused monitoring program on alien species in Soldana Bay using both 
focused conventional sampling techniques where we go out, collect samples, and look at them, see what species are present there, and try and work out which ones of those are alien, but also through some very new innovative techniques called environmental or eDNA. Next slide, please. Um, eDNA is uh, the, the latest and greatest thing in marine environmental research. It's environmental DNA or eDNA is what we call organism, organismal DNA. So it's e DNA from living organisms that we can find, find in water or sediments, either in the marine environment or in fresh water. It originates from cellular ma material like skin, mucus, scales, feces from animals that is shed into the water. And uh, simply by collecting samples of water or sediment, we can analyze those in the lab and we can detect the DNA and then we can work out, ah, that species or this species must be present in that environment because we can find its DNA. Every single species has a unique set of DNA. So by, so by, by collecting, rather than having to find and collect each of those organisms individually, we can merely take a sample of water, analyze it, and work out what species might be present, might have been present in that body of water. Because the DNA gets diluted in the water and dispersed around, so it spreads out a long way from where the original organism was. This is really, really great. Uh, for alien species, which when they first arrive, are often in low numbers, they're difficult to detect, they're not always that obvious, they look like the local organisms. So eDNA is very, it's definitive. We know, as soon as we detect DNA from an alien species, we know precisely, yes, that alien species must be here, because its DNA is present here. And in the alien species game, early detection is critically important because that's the only opportunity often that you have to get rid of these things before they start to become too abundant. Once they start to spread out all over the place, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. So it's easy to get rid of them when there are only a handful of them, very difficult when they've spread out all over the place. So for me, this is a very exciting program and has uh, generated some quite interesting results to date. Can you give me the next slide, please? So last year we started with this alien species monitoring program using eDNA that uh, um, Anglo-American Kumba Iron Ore have funded. Uh, we, we saw, in fact, we started sampling in 2022 last year and we collected some ballast water samples directly from the ships that, have, that arrived in Soldana Bay. We collected those ballast water samples, seven of them, and we tested them for eDNA to see what alien species are arriving in the bay. But we also collected seawater samples from all over the bay, right up into the top of the lagoon. We collected a whole lot of sediment samples from all over the place, because that DNA also tends to accumulate in the sediments. And then we also scraped biota or samples of biological material off the key walls, off the mariculture infrastructure, and off reefs in the bay to try and see what alien species might be present there. And we processed these samples, we picked through them, we took out the, one, the species we could clearly identify were alien, we also put them in the liquidizer and sent them to uh, a group in the UK by the name of Nature Metrics, who's doing, who's pioneering this eDNA work. And uh, they looked at for uh, what species DNA they could find in those samples, focusing particularly on alien species. And they looked at all the major groups. Our focus is always on the larger things, the invertebrates, things that are bigger, things that we can see, but they were able to look at bacteria and uh, viruses as well, and, uh, but also the larger vertebrates like whales, fish, dolphins. Next slide, please. And we got some quite interesting results. Um, some of them were quite surprising. The ballast water, we, in the, we didn't analyze those using our conventional techniques. These were only analyzed with the uh, eDNA, and surprisingly, we didn't find any alien organisms in those samples. There were lots of uh, living organisms or marine organisms in those samples, mostly bacteria, fungi, viruses, so we weren't sure whether they were alien or not, but none of them were what we considered confirmed alien species. The water samples we collected in the bay, we got, again, we've got information on lots of birds and fish species, a couple of mammal species, uh, but no confirmed alien species. In the so sediment samples, we did a bit better. Again, we got lots of different species, but we got um, at least three confirmed or suspected alien species, 
Uh, one was the invasive mussel semi-mitilis, which is this one over here. We had recorded previously in the bay. It comes from South America. It invaded South of our, our waters about 10 years ago. And uh, we recorded two other new gastropods, these little snails here, which we've never seen before. We've never found them before. Their DNA was present in the sediment samples in the bay, so we're pretty sure they are here. And uh, that's quite a novel result. Um, the wall scrape samples, the samples we collected from the Dolosa, from the Mariculture infrastructure, again, lots of different species. Here we've got six new alien species with this eDNA work. A um, couple of worms, um, ascidians, um, hydroids, all small species. But one of the most in interesting findings is that um, what we had previously attributed, uh, the, the alien mussel species, it's called Mytilus gallop provincialis, it's the Mediterranean mussel. It's dominant across the rocky shores throughout the bay. It's, if you go down to any rocky shore in the bay, you'll see these black mussels all over the place. And we always thought that these were merely uh, one species of Mediterranean mussel. The eDNA results suggest that in fact there are three species of European mussel here. There is the bay mussel, which has not been previously recorded, and also the blue mussel. So we think we've got three different species of European mussel here. And uh, for me, very interesting result. We do need to confirm that and do need to do a bit more work on that. Um, it was always very odd from my perspective. The Mediterranean mussel naturally occurs in estuaries in Europe. And I always found it quite odd. Why would a mussel that normally lives in estuaries suddenly invade rocky shores all over the place? And I think maybe that's part of the reason is this misidentification. In fact, maybe what we've got here on our rocky shores are one of two of the other species. And if those of you that may, some of you may remember, the, the, the European mussel invaded Langaban Lagoon many years ago, started forming massive beds across the sandbanks in the lagoon. And uh, again, we attributed that to one species, the Mediterranean mussel. And now I'm thinking maybe that was one of these other species, or maybe that was the real Mediterranean mussel, and the other species are on the rocky shore here. So this, this eDNA work has been incredibly interesting and has yielded some really, really interesting results and is giving us a better understanding or handle on, on alien species in the bay. Next slide. Maybe you want to know why we care about alien species. Um, they are a huge problem worldwide. Um, someone recently look, did an estimate of the, the co economic costs of aquatic alien invasive species around the world, and they estimated a figure of 345 billion rand damage costs associated with alien species. Um, I must stress that is, they're speaking here not necessarily about marine aliens. These are aquatic aliens, so they include freshwater species. The biggest problem worldwide is the mosquito. Um, but fish are also next in line. That's a, a, a mussel species. That's, those are mussel species next in line. Um, little water fleas, amphibians, uh, pr various plants, um, and other species. Um, global map of uh, sort of cost map is very interesting. Um, South Africa down there, you can see we are registered as a net cost in terms of alien species introduction. But interestingly, in West Africa, where carp and uh, certain species of tilapia are used extensively for freshwater aquaculture. Actually, that's a net benefit. That scale goes from zero in the middle there to cost over there, three billion, and, three, and uh, uh, benefit down there. So yes, alien species are, uh, for some people, are great. Our mussel aquaculture industry in Soldana Bay is based on Mediterranean mussel, alien species. So there is uh, a net positive, there's a positive impact there, but there's also a net cost associated with those other alien species. They are a major problem, they make a major contribution to disease burden in countries. That's why uh, a mosquito comes up so strongly there. They also contribute to loss of income due to tourism. People don't want to go to malarial areas and any area 
where there are diseases. They in compete economically with native species, wild capture fisheries, aquaculture industries, the world over. Um, they can also cause significant damage to infrastructure. Uh, zebra mussel in, the, in Europe and North America, as a case in point, caused enormous damage to uh, harbour infrastructure up there. Um, costs of alien species are going up enormously over the years. This is uh, time, time since si the 1960s and up till, th up till the 1990s, very little cost. But in the last few years, costs have been going up exponentially and we expect that those costs will continue to go forward. So it is something that we are very concerned about. It does have a significant impact on our local ecosystems. Um, and there are some alien species that are showing signs of causing serious problems here. So it is something we need to control, we need to keep an eye on. Um, I think that's all I want to say. I'm just going to summarize on the next slide. Um, development pressure is continuing to ramp up in the bay all the time after stalling for a short while because of the global financial crisis, COVID. Um, so we need, to be, we need to be cognizant, we need to be aware, we need to keep track of it. Numbers of tourists in this area are down, and that's very important for our economy. I said a little bit about groundwater reserves in this area. They're stable. They even seem to have increased in the last few years, which is encouraging. And uh, all the data that we have suggests that our use of groundwater in this area is probably sustainable as long as it's carefully managed going forwards. For me, a very interesting finding that we've come through with now is that this increase in wave intensity, wave energy in this area, it's increased by almost 50% since the 1960s. And that is playing out in the damage, the coastal erosion, the erosion along 16 Mile Beach, erosion on Langabound Beach, erosion in Big Bay. It's becoming a huge problem. We need to get a handle on this. We need to do something about this. The groins in, in, in Lang on Langabound Main Beach haven't been maintained in the last five years. They are disintegrating. And very soon we're going to be back to a position where those beaches start to erode very, very badly. Um, water quality, um, mostly okay, but I've s I pointed out the dramatic increase in fecal coliform levels opposite Langabon Main Beach in the last few years, or well, sorry, the last year, in the last 12 months. I think that is because of the lack of management of stormwater infrastructure in that area. That's, there's a problem there. Uh, sediment quality has definitely improved in the bay over the last uh, 30 years, and to me very encouraging, and that is playing out in some fairly dramatic improvements in the communities, the organisms that live in the soft sediments in the bay, which is very encouraging. Um, I highlighted the fact we don't know a lot about communities that inhabit hard substratum habitats in the bay, we know that many of these areas are coming under increasing threat and hopefully we'll be able to get a better handle on that going forwards. Fish populations in the bay are largely stable, but they, we do seem to be losing some of the more sensitive species, which is concerning. Birds breeding on the islands have declined massively over the years. There has been a slight increase in the last few years, thanks to the pelican watch, the seal watch people, that is having paying dividends there. Um, marine aliens are increasing. We're getting better at finding them, but uh, there's still something, they're still a huge concern for me. Overall, I think we're doing quite well. Smiley face, um, but don't take your eyes off the road because I think things can still deteriorate. There's a lot of pressure coming, pressure's ramping up all the time. And uh, the work that the trust does, I think, is enormously valuable in trying to keep this in hand. I think that's the end. Thank you.